breaking the myth of Iran sanctions. Thanks to everyone for coming out here tonight. We're so excited to see so many people interested in learning more about this topic. My name is Teresa Schaefer, and I'm the Security Outreach Associate at Physicians for Social Responsibility. I'll be hosting the webinar tonight. And just to give you a quick breakdown, the webinar will go about an hour, and all attendees will be muted in order to avoid any technical problems. However, we do encourage you to ask any questions you may have by typing them in the question box, and we'll try to address as many as we can at the end of the presentation. Without further ado, I'd like to present Kate Gould, who is our guest speaker tonight. Kate is Friends Committee um, for National Legislation's lead lobbyist on Middle East policy. She has advocated on Middle East policy issues for more than six years and is one of only a handful of registered lobbyists in Washington, D.C., working to prevent war with Iran. In short, she's an all-out expert on this topic, and we are extremely honored to have her on our webinar tonight. With that, Kate, I will hand it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Teresa. And thank you, Physicians for Social Responsibility. It is an honor to be with you all tonight. I remember when I first was acquainted with PSR, was back when I started at FCNL in 2007, working on Iran policy matters. And uh, that was a, a very hard time. Uh, it was a year when we saw the US and Iran continue to teeter on the brink of war. Um, it looked at, as there were many points during that year where we thought there could be a bombing um, any day and, and with the, uh, under the Bush administration. And, um, and I remember it was so heartening to hear about the work that PSR was doing in, uh, and also arranging for um, and setting up dialogue with physicians in Iran. And I thought that was um, so important. And I hope that there's so many more opportunities for that work going forward. And I think it's, it's just a, a little taste of uh, the kinds of immense possibilities we have um, if this progress, the diplomatic progress that we've seen over the last few years, if that continues and we actually have a final deal with Iran, um, then there are, there's just a world of possibilities. And I wanted to um, start tonight with the outline of uh, some of the basic uh, points we're going to hit on. So first, of course, you know, what's the big deal about a deal? Uh, why is this issue so important? And then what, what's Congress's role in this? So what's, what's the game plan with Iran, and why is the role that Congress plays so important in perhaps making or breaking a deal? And then finally, where things stand now with the negotiations. So on the first point, I guess, on why this deal is so important, really gets back to uh, the, what I was talking about with 2007 being such a dark year uh, for this work, seeing when the US and Iran um, multiple times when these countries nearly uh, went to war and where, where escalations um, could have quickly escalated and we could have seen a, a full-blown war. Um, and that, that's precisely why it's so important to get a deal that we want to see the US and Iran um, move itself uh, and leave behind its history of just this perpetual you know, vicious cycle of confrontation um, that dates back from even before the hostage crisis to the US overthrow of Iran's democratically elected government in the 50s and then uh, moving forward to the hostage crisis. And then we saw the you know, Iran-Iraq war, and there's been um, so much tension built over time, so much distrust, and it has had a, an immensely destabilizing impact on the region for, um, for conflict in the region and the world and for uh, the efforts that um, this network is so keen on, on, on nonproliferation. So it's uh, something that, that has to be resolved, um, and the only way that it can be resolved is through diplomacy. So that is why um, it was so exciting 
when in November 2013 we saw we finally got a short-term agreement with Iran. So that was the called Joint Plan of Action, and it was agreed to after marathon negotiations. So uh, it actually took years for these negotiations to reach this point, uh, and then even in the final hour. Um, the final days leading up to the agreement, we saw actually um, you know, Secretary Kerry was negotiating for 23 straight hours before they finally struck a deal um, way past midnight in Geneva. And, so, and, and then he delivered a, a press conference um, of the, all about the, the kinds of uh, accomplishments of the night. Um, it, it's taken a lot of work, and we've seen our own countries, you know, over these years change um, enormously. The political landscape has changed. We are now in a position where we have in the U.S. an administration that was elected um, in part on a platform of actually engaging with Iran on this issue, solving the issue through diplomacy. And in Iran, we've seen President Rouhani uh, how he was elected on the platform of engagement with the U.S., with the West, um, and had a more conciliatory approach on the, the nuclear issue than we've seen with their predecessors, a more moderate approach. Um, and finally, the stars aligned. Uh, lots of work was put into finally reaching this agreement, not just from the negotiators in the room uh, who are on the front lines, but also it came about because of the people, I know many of whom are on this call, who worked for years um, in pushing Congress and calling and emailing and helping to build the political space to make this kind of deal possible. So we finally got a deal. And then the deal was an enormous success and has continued to be. Um, it has frozen Iran's nuclear program. So what that means is that uh, Iran had, continues to have a civilian nuclear program, a nuclear, a civilian enrichment program, um, but they have frozen their progress on their nuclear program. So while we've, we have been seeing for years that Iran's nuclear program has continued to escalate, um, that uh, there have been points of uh, where it looked like just the you know, unconstrained nuclear enrichment um, while Iran was also looking at a uh, plutonium pathway um, and, and saying, of course, all of this is for, Iran's case has been that it's all for, um, strictly for uh, civilian purposes, for nuclear energy. And the U.S. intelligence, meanwhile, um, U.S. intelligence estimates, U.S. intelligence agencies have been saying that Iran did have a nuclear weapons program up until 2003, then they halted it, and they have not made a decision to restart that program since. Um, of course, the concern is that they would restart it, and this nuclear deal, this joint plan of action, also called the JPOA, uh, has frozen Iran's nuclear program. It has uh, frozen and rolled back Iran's, uh, parts of Iran's nuclear program for the first time in a decade. Um, it has meant that Iran has roughly double the number of inspectors, um, of international atomic energy inspectors, looking at Iran's nuclear program. Um, if they're looking at the enrichment sites every single day. So, you know, huge accomplishment, and this uh, fact that the nuclear deal um, has frozen Iran's progress, and that's verified by the IAEA every month since this deal was reached, um, in, in, sorry, since it went into effect, which was last January, the fact that that has continued, that progress has continued, uh, shows that Iran it, um, is not able to just continue to make progress on its nuclear program while it's talking with the U.S., that in fact this freezes Iran's nuclear program and at the same time in exchange freezes the U.S. and European Union's sanction regime. So that was, that's the fundamental basis of this agreement was that um, while both sides were going to work toward a final agreement, they would freeze uh, the, on one side the sanctions regime and on one side the nuclear program. 
So it has been an enormous success um, and helped de-escalate tensions. And ever since, it, the US, Iran, and the other negotiating partners involved uh, with the permanent members of the UN Security Council, so um, the Europeans, the EU, Germany, uh, France, Great Britain, Russia, and China, they've all been involved in these um, continuous negotiations and it's it's become now become commonplace for Secretary Kerry and Foreign Minister Zarif, who's the equivalent um, in Iran, for them to be communicating. And this of course was unheard of um, before this, this agreement was was struck. So we've seen some enormous progress um, over these last uh, you know, especially since November twenty thirteen in reaching this agreement. Um, and just to go through a bit of the timeline, so first we have that the agreement, the Joint Plan of Action was signed in November 2013. It went into effect last year, um, January 2014. Then the idea was that it would um, be in effect until July. Uh, but as the negotiators got closer to their deadline, the, uh, they decided that they weren't quite ready with a final agreement, so they wanted to extend the agreement through November. Then when we got to November, um, they, they again, they, they, we've heard uh, from people who were very close to the negotiators, they were very close to a comprehensive agreement, but they didn't quite make it. And uh, so they agreed instead to continue the joint plan of action but I put the Joint Plan of Action Plus because in addition to the agreement that we already had, um, it made additional uh, obligations. It imposed additional obligations on Iran. So it required that Iran, for example, allow um, no notice inspections for the IAEA, the Atomic, uh, International Atomic Energy Agency, to visit Iran's centrifuge production facilities. So this is, uh, helps meet the IAEA's longstanding request to look at um, every aspect of Iran's nuclear program at every stage of its production, um, at every stage of, of development. So that was a, a big breakthrough. And again, um, it, is, it has made the world safer than without an agreement. Uh, we've seen, we saw before that Iran's nuclear program just continued to grow and grow and grow. And suddenly, it was uh, the progress was was frozen um, and partially held, um, rolled back. So then we are January 2015. We're at a point where Congress has been threatening new sanctions um, and also threatening to vote against a prospective deal. So that's what we're facing now. However, even this week has been an enormous. We've seen an enormous accomplishment that the pro-diplomacy um, forces, including many of you have had with uh, your work in, in getting Congress to hold off on pushing for new sanctions. The proponents of the sanctions bill, they wanted to have a deal, um, th 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 sorry, they wanted to have a uh, vote on new sanctions that would sabotage an agreement. Um, they wanted to have that in January, this month. And now we're at the end of January. There's no sanctions vote um, on the floor, at least, that, that's going to happen this month. And even the, one of the lead proponents, Senator Menendez, of this legislation, he has said he's going to hold off on pushing this for two months um, until we get to March. March is going to be a very busy time when the Israeli Prime Minister, Netanyahu, is going to address Congress. Um, I'll talk more about that later. And then we have June 30th this year, which is the deadline for a final deal. So this is the deal that we um, that would actually peacefully resolve the this issue, this decade-long dispute over Iran's nuclear program, and permanently guard against a nuclear-armed Iran and the prospect of another U.S. war in the Middle East. So that's the um, the overall time frame. And we hear from some of the proponents of sanctions legislation that, well, we can't trust Iran. That, that's actually probably the, the thing I hear most often from members of Congress and from their staff, their immediate knee-jerk reaction when I talk about how important it is to support this process 
to peacefully prevent a nuclear armed Iran and stop us from getting into another war, they say, well, we just can't trust Iran. We've seen their, you know, how um, they're supporting uh, terrorist groups and they have lied to us before and they're doing all these awful things. Um, so the point to make then, when you hear that from members of Congress, is, look, this this agreement is not built on blind trust. In fact, it is built on verification. Um, not, not blind trust, but stringent verification measures that keep Iran's nuclear program under lock and key. So the, the best you know, eyes and ears we have on the ground are through the IAEA. And, and they, um, you know, they have double the number of inspectors. They're there every day in Iran. Um, and they are verifying that Iran is indeed keeping their program frozen. Um, and if Iran cheats, then they're there to tell us to immediately detect any activity that is, is not OK, is a violation of the agreement. Um, and they would sound the alarm if Iran tries to cheat. So we, we have that information. Um, and they're reporting on it every month. They, they have a separate track of negotiations with Iran about access as well. Uh, but already we're seeing, I mean, they have uh, the, you know, the best access that they've had in years, um, far greater access than they had before the agreement was struck. Before the agreement, we had, they had um, bi-monthly visits to Iran's enrichment facilities. Now they're there at Iran's enrichment facilities every single day. So Iran's nuclear program is under lock, key, and camera. Why we need a deal um, is, why we need a comprehensive deal, I should say, is because um, we want a long-term solution to this. So this joint plan of action has done an amazing job in freezing and rolling back Iran's nuclear program and allowing the space for all of our countries to sort this out. But we need a, a long-term agreement that's going to ensure that, our, that going forward for years and years um, that Iran's nuclear program will be used for civilian use only, that there'll be even better verification in place um, you know, so that will limit the potential for any kind of plutonium pathway toward a nuclear bomb. If we don't get a deal, we don't get any of those things. We're facing a situation where Iran's enrichment levels, you know, would be unconstrained, um, unlimited expansion to the number of centrifuges, and and far less access. And we're we could see a situation where they, you know forge ahead um, toward a plutonium pathway, toward a bomb. So we, we do need a deal. Um, and it's uh, when um, there's, you know, there's a lot of those in Congress who've criticized what a deal is, is um, what it looks like that the outlines of a, of a final deal would be. They say that Iran shouldn't be allowed to have a nuclear program at all. And of course, um, you know, I, that would be the ideal way as far as you know, non-proliferation concerns go um, and other concerns about nuclear energy go. I'm sure most of you would agree, many of you would agree with that. Um, but uh, we're not living in a, you know, in a world where we can get everything we want right away. Um, and while hope, you know, maybe at some point Iran will decide not to have a nuclear program, that is far, far into the future. Iran, uh, nuclear energy is extraordinarily popular in Iran. Iran is never going to, I mean, never in the foreseeable future going to agree to stop its, its nuclear enrichment program. It's, it's, seen, uh, it's very much tied up with ideas about sovereignty for Iran. Um, so it's when, uh, certainly there are things to criticize about a deal. Um, there are ways that in the, you know, if we wanted perfection, uh, we could talk about a different looking deal. But when we talk about uh, what what are the real alternatives, you got, you can either get you get a deal, or if you get no deal, then um, then there's unconstrained Iranian enrichment. Then the U.S. and Iran may be moving on a path toward an eventual war. Um, so it's when when. People, uh, when members of Congress particularly criticize that the deal isn't perfect, um, the important point to raise is, well, what's your alternative? Because if we don't have inspectors on the ground, um, then we're looking at a scenario where in the future we, we could have 
we, we could even have U.S. ground troops on the you know on the ground. So um, one more reason to uh, to work toward a, toward a deal. The sanctions, the place of sanctions in this is is very important because, as I said, while Iran um, has agreed under this arrangement to freeze its nuclear program, the U.S. and its partners have agreed to freeze their sanctions regime. Um, that is one of the main incentives for Iran to uh, move ahead with these, these far-reaching nuclear concessions. Sanctions, imposing new sanctions, would be a violation of the um, terms of the agreement, the joint plan of action. So Senator Murphy, See, we have a picture of him here. Um, he has been a major champion in this effort. He's opposed new sanctions. And while proponents of sanctions are saying that we need to have more pressure on Iran, in fact, uh, and, and that you need to send them a message that we're serious, um, in fact, new sanctions would uh, push Iran away from the negotiating table because it would be a violation, um, and and depending on how the sanctions work, you know, it would either be a violation uh, by the letter of the agreement or it would be a violation of the spirit of the agreement. But either way, it would be seen that the U.S. is not negotiating in good faith. Uh, the U. It would be like Iran um, escalating its nuclear program at the same time as these negotiations are going on. So it would send a very bad signal. Um, that it's not worthwhile for the for Iran to negotiate with the U.S. That um, and that even if the, Iran does negotiate with the Obama administration, it doesn't matter because Congress can just sabotage the whole thing by passing new sanctions anyway um, and violating the agreement. That's particularly concerning because eventually Congress will have to repeal sanctions. So um, that any kind of agreement will likely be in stages. It'll it would likely be a decade-long agreement or something along those lines. Um, so there'd be there'd be steps that both countries would take right away, and then there'd be steps they'd take later on. And some of the later on steps for the U.S. would be that the U.S. Congress would have to actually lift sanctions through legislation, uh, rather than through executive order, which the president could do right away. That so Iran needs to know that Congress is going to play ball, that if Iran complies with its agreement, um, with its obligations, as it has so far, over this whole year, Iran has scrupulously adhered to, this, to the joint plan of action, then Iran needs to know that Congress isn't going to, is going to adhere with its, its end of the bargain, um, that both sides are going to uphold the bargain, and that um, and what, they, uh, what hardliners in Iran say is, don't bother negotiating with Iran because Sorry, don't bother negotiating with the U.S. because they just want regime change. They don't really care about the nuclear program. Um, and so for Congress to then go ahead with new sanctions, it empowers those hardliners and undermines those who are more moderate in Iran looking for a solution out of this. So Chris Murphy said, Senator Chris Murphy, a new round of sanctions risks not just screwing up the negotiation but sending the message to the Iranian people who are frankly far more pro-American than people might think that we aren't really serious about ultimately doing the deal they want. So we also have seen that um, the grassroots component has been very important uh, for this, for shaping what um, Congress does on this. That uh, the last year it looked like the Senate was going to move ahead with sanctions. Um, the House was looking like it was going to move ahead with sanctions as well. And then before that even happened, a group of lawmakers who have supported diplomacy with Iran started this Give Diplomacy a Chance letter, or sign on letter. Um, they got more than 100 members to sign on telling the House leadership um, that they uh, were they did not want to see any kind of um, sanctions legislation move forward. So it was a, a major victory, and it happened because people, I'm sure many of you on this call, were writing and calling Congress, um, and we're calling the Senate as well to stop to stop their sanctions bill. And we, we got through the whole year. We got through the joint plan of action without any new sanctions being imposed. So that's a, a huge victory and has allowed for the negotiations to proceed as they have. Um, and we've seen that has had an impact that has touched Iran as well. So 
that in Iran, uh, this news, for example, about the letter, they, they follow Congress more closely than you know, many in the US do. Um, the Iranian newspaper headline, which of course the translation is a little funny, but breeze of moderation reached USA, 104 members of Congress support negotiations with Iran. Uh, front page news story, you know, all over Iran and the major outlets. So it was, um, it's, it's had a big, you know, big impact on helping to create the political space both in this country and in Iran um, for a deal, for, for some compromise with the U.S. And we've seen that, that those kinds of, um, you know, that, that kind of pro-diplomacy support, it's in, uh, it, it's in Iran, it's in the U.S., um, it's, there are uh, some surprising voices around the world who are supporting this push. Um, so there's this, uh, and I bring up uh, Israeli Brigadier General Uzi Alam, who's a retired Israeli general. Um, he actually helped found Israel's nuclear program, and he has been supporting uh, talks with Iran. He supported these negotiations to get a deal and to not uh, oppose efforts for, um, you know, for escalating tensions. And instead, said we need, we really need to focus on these on these talks. We had him uh, present at our at our lobby day um, in November, and this is a picture of him. And we have. Um, a number of voices coming out now as well saying we don't want new sanctions, um, we, we want to see these talks succeed. So there are voices in Israel and of course uh, many of the Obama administration now have become some of the most foremost um, proponents of, uh, of making this work. Making, you know, it, it's obviously a huge priority uh, for the Obama administration could be the signature uh, foreign policy legacy. And we saw that Ambassador Samantha Power, she said, if we pull the trigger on new nuclear-related sanctions now, we will go from isolating Iran to potentially isolating ourselves. So a very strong statement. Um, we saw that the State of the Union that the President said, new sanctions passed by this Congress will all but guarantee that diplomacy fails, alienating America from its allies and ensuring that Iran starts up its nuclear program again. So um, I know we'll go into, I know uh, Teresa's going to go into the uh, myth busters that we've gone through a bit, and there'll be more uh, questions where we can get into um, to more of this. I just want to say, though, again, I mean, I think that um, this is a really pivotal time for grassroots action, and you know, she'll be talking more about um, different actions that people can take. Uh, it has made a huge impact. We've seen it over the years. Um, we've seen it, especially this week, in pushing off new sanctions. Um, and that it's particularly important in the context of you know where we are now, which is that the um, the U.S. and Iran will be um, you know the, the the negotiations are continuing there. Uh, we've heard that they are, uh, they're very close. Um, they've worked out some pretty thorny issues, um, like dealing with the Iraq plutonium facility, some, some um, creative ways to deal with those issues. They, but there's still this, this fundamental disagreement about um, some of the, the questions of, of the size and scope of Iran's nuclear um, enrichment program that could be uh, allowed. Um, under a final deal, so there are there are these concerns to iron out, um, and right now they are working. Negotiators are working toward um, finalizing some of the major elements of a deal in March, and then some of the what they call you know framework, um, trying to get a framework in March, and then uh, then working toward getting all the technical details figured out by the end of June, June thirtieth. Um, so. That is, um, that's a bit about where we are now, but happy to answer questions about that later on, too. All right. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, so to sum up everything, you should now be equipped to bust any myths that hardliners in Congress may have when it comes to additional sanctions legislation against Iran. Um, so the myth that more sanctions against Iran will force them to make a deal is busted because if more sanctions are put into place against Iran at this time, it would be a violation of the Joint Plan of Action. 
the Joint Plan of Action stipulates that no additional nuclear-related sanctions will be put in place against Iran during the negotiation process. The U.S. would therefore be in violation of this, and it would allow Iranians to put the blame of failed talks on the United States. So the next myth, that Iran is stringing us along while ramping up their nuclear program, is also busted because the Joint Plan of Action has temporarily frozen Iran's nuclear program. This would not be the case if negotiations never happened, and this is why negotiations need to continue in order to get a permanent and comprehensive agreement with Iran. War is neither wanted, nor will it stop Iran from obtaining nuclear weapons capability. The last myth, that we have no way to verify if Iran cheats the agreement, is also busted because the International Atomic Energy Agency, or the IAEA, which is a branch of the United Nations that keeps tabs on nuclear facilities, has greatly expanded access to Iran's facilities. So action steps. All right, so now that you're equipped to bust these senators' myths, what can you do about it? Well, you can call Congress and request your senators to oppose additional sanctions legislation on Iran. You can email Congress and do the same. At PSR, we currently have an action alert to email the senators in your state if you'd like to use that. You can write an op-ed and send it into your local newspaper, or you can respond to an article you saw in the paper by writing a letter to the editor. You can lobby the representatives, senators, and congressional staff in your state and you can use social media to Facebook and tweet at your senators. Tomorrow, everyone should receive a follow-up email, and it will list helpful tips on how to phone and tweet your Congress members. Um, there will also be a link to our action alert to email your senators, and there will be a link to show you how to submit op-eds and letters to the editor. All right, here are some examples of letters to the editor. For those of you who might not be familiar with these, they are short responses to articles you find in the paper that detail your own views and opinions, and it's typically easier to get these published rather than op-eds. Here's a map of where people have taken action already across the United States. As Kate mentioned, this grassroots effort is extremely important and has already proven successful by causing Senators Kirk and Menendez to back off. And here are some pictures of SCNL people lobbying. We hope to see some pictures from you and your state offices as well. And lastly, here is our contact information. Please feel free to contact either of us if you have any questions or if you'd simply like to boast your success, whether it's an op-ed or a picture with representatives. We'd absolutely love to hear about it. At this point, this concludes the presentation part of the webinar. Um, I'll, not, I'll now hand it over to Martin Schleck, who is the Security Director at Physicians for Social Responsibility. He's been compiling your questions throughout the presentation, so I'll go ahead and hand it over to him. Hello. Thank you, Teresa. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, all right. Yes, we've got some great questions here, uh, and I'm going to group a couple of them together um, for starters. And I want to say thanks to those who have been sending in your questions and don't stop. Um, how about this one? What are the biggest disinformation talking points coming from opponents to a deal? Um, and what kind of, and then related to that, what kind of lobbying is going on behind the scenes? And where is the funding coming from to oppose the deal? And another person asked a related question, which was, who are the lobbyists who are educating politicians on the narrative that says, Iran is evil? Mm. Good questions. OK. So on the talking points, um, the most dangerous talking points that we hear uh, that are just not true and, and we need some myth busting for, um, we hear, I would say, listening to, for example, the Senate banking hearing yesterday when they talked about Iran sanctions. Um, it was as if they had the same talking points as they, you know, they were using the same talking points today as they were using before the Joint Plan of Action. I mean, they they just didn't reference the progress that's been made, and it's, I mean, they they talk about the problems that we have in Iran with Iran, which are very real and significant, but um, 
I think the point is like, well, what's going to help uh, resolve these issues and uh, look at you know the progress that has been made and how can we make more progress? So I guess I would say um, one is that many lawmakers they don't understand the kind of progress that has been made. Um, they think that we we don't you know that that these all, all that we've seen is that the extensions have been um, you know do we keep having more extensions and that we there hasn't been progress in between but in fact we've seen um, that with each extension that means an extension of uh, this intensive monitoring program on you know of, over Iran this means that um, the rollbacks the freezing of Iran's nuclear progress has continued so it's a you know, there's there's a lot of progress, and um, you know, and then another, I would say, I mean, the reason why this issue is just so important is because this is not just about Iran. This is about something much bigger. And the opposition have been saying, well, you just can't negotiate with evil. You know, we've heard that before. I mean, you can't negotiate with with traditional adversaries. And um, so, part of I think why this has the power to really transform the way that the U.S. engages with the Middle East and the world is because it's about saying. Look, we negotiations are not just about talking with your friends. They're about talking with um, with countries and people that you disagree with, and that you're going to work on a solution so that we don't kill each other. I mean, that, that's what this is really about. So, um, I think pointing out that the, the progress that has been made so far in preventing Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon and the importance of diplomacy to stop us from getting into another war; those are the two key points. About uh, some of the other groups that are working on the, or the the other people who are educating lawmakers about uh, to to um, respond to this idea, well, Iran is just evil. I mean that um, I hope I hope all of you on the call uh, will count yourself among those educators. We need far more of them. I mean there are um, you know of course FCNL and PSR, and then we work with a broader coalition of peace and security groups. But we need more people out there and. Um, and I would say, rather than get into you know it, this this whole debate about whether you call Iran evil, I mean it's it's really about uh, looking at okay, how do we solve this problem? What's the constructive way to do so? Um, and rather than get into this situation where you're seen as defending Iran, I think it's best to go into okay, yes, there are real problems with Iran with, that we have with Iran. Let's figure out a way to deal with them. Diplomacy is clearly the best way, as we've heard from so many national security experts. Um, I will say that we we know, uh, you know, just as far as the other groups that are uh, in the opposition, we know that, that Prime Minister Netanyahu is going to come um, on March 3rd, address Congress, stand at the same spot where President Obama gave his State of the Union, and he's going to give a very different speech. Um, and Iran is going to be a major theme of it. He's going to be uh, talking likely about the need for more sanctions, more pressure, more congressional obstructionism for the talks. Um, and so that will have a powerful impact on members of Congress, and that's why it is just so important for you to engage now. And I'll keep the rest of my answers much shorter. Sorry about that. Well, thanks, Kate. Um, here's another one. Uh, what do you think about the quest for Congress to have a role, uh, in other words, to be able to vote up or down on the Iran deal? Um, as has been proposed by Foreign Relations Committee Chair Senator Corker. So FCNL is very much opposed to that effort. Um, we have seen that um, when it, it just it doesn't make any sense for Congress to do that. This is not a treaty. This is an agreement, a multilateral agreement, and it would set a um, very concerning precedent for. The, for Congress to start having votes on these multilateral agreements that um, that Congress simply does not have a constitutional role uh, on. Well, Congress, you know, Congress does have a constitutional role for oversight um, to ensure that both the U.S. and Iran are complying um, with the agreement. But uh, for we, we saw a, a forced vote on this right away. That would um, likely. Of course, in this kind of Congress, it would be voted down, an agreement would be rejected, and then uh, at least, uh, I mean, and, and I'm talking about Corker's legislation, the, the legislation that was introduced um, 
last year, and we haven't seen the new um, legislation for this year, but at least for last year, what we saw, what, what Corker's proposal was, is that it would require a vote, um, and then it would cut any funding. It, if an agreement was um, rejected by Congress, it would cut funding for implementation of that. It would even cut funding for the IAEA to um, to monitor Iran's nuclear program as part of the requirements of, of this uh, deal that's reached, but a potential deal. So we could sabotage the negotiations altogether. Okay. Um, here's another one, Kate. Um, it's kind of about looking at it from the view of Iran. Isn't the reason that Iran has looked at developing nuclear weapons uh, isn't that about um, the constant talk of aggression against Iran by Israel and the U.S.? Um, and the question, that's, that's the question is, you know, given the constant talk of aggression, uh, doesn't it have a lot to do with Iran thinking that it needs to develop a nuclear weapon? And wouldn't it help if Iran could feel it was not under constant threat of attack, almost independent of what they're doing with their nuclear weapons work? Well, first point to make here is that Iran currently does not have a nuclear weapons program and that according to U.S. intelligence estimates that um, Iran has not even made a decision to build a nuclear weapon. So uh, the consensus of U.S. intelligence agencies is that Iran had a nuclear and I know I, I said this earlier, but I think it's, it's a very important point, and um, we've seen before that the, you know, there have been polls that show most Americans think Iran already has a nuclear weapon, and, um, and it's important to note that no, Iran does not have a nuclear weapon. According to U.S. intelligence agencies, they had a, nu a nuclear weapons program. They didn't have a nuclear weapon, but they were moving toward a nuclear weapon um, in 2000, uh, it, sorry, up until 2003, then they halted their program. Um, and they have not made a decision since. And we've heard that from the Director of National Intelligence, um, James Clapper, he, and he'll be delivering another testimony soon, but he has said that with a high degree of confidence um, that the U.S. intelligence agencies know that Iran has not made a decision to weaponize. So th that's the first point. Um, what, is, what seems more likely, what a number of experts talk about, is that Iran may be moving toward what's often called the Japan option of just of, of escalating its nuclear program to the point where if they wanted to build a nuclear weapon, it would be easier for them to do so. Um, so, so, so clearly, I mean, they, they have taken these provocative stances with their, their nuclear program um, even more recently. And, and wh why is that? So the, the um, caller was asking about uh, we, yeah, what's what's behind this Iranian aggression, and, um, and certainly, I mean, I think what we want to see, um, you know, what is the end of um, we want to see a, a Middle East, um, you know, WMD free zone in, in the Middle East. I mean, of course, th throughout the world, where yes, Iran does not feel those kinds of threats uh, from other countries, and and of course, that would make it uh, far more likely that Iran would compromise and be more willing to make a deal. Uh, that when countries are are under perceived real or perceived threats, um, that they're far more hardline in their approach. Um, but it is notable that despite the, these kinds of threats that we've seen recently, where both, yeah, I mean, the U.S. and Israel, you know, have, have threatened Iran, and, and despite that, according to our own U.S. intelligence agencies, Iran has not made a decision to go for the bomb since 2003. Okay. Um, how about this question, Kate? Um, my congressman is pro-diplomacy. Pro uh, we hope they're all pro-democracy, right? My congressman is pro-diplomacy. Do you recommend lobbying other congress congresspersons? No, I don't. Uh, I mean, well, hold on. Let me back that up. Okay. Um, so, uh, if you are outside Washington D.C. and in the um, the rest of the United States, aside from the territories, which also don't get a vote, uh, then you have, of course, a representative and you have two senators. So hopefully you have three members of Congress that you can lobby. Um, so I would recommend certainly lobbying all of them often and, uh, and much and, and in person and over the phone and through email. 
uh, developing a relationship with them. That's really how things work. Um, it's how things work in our own lives, personal lives, and it's how things um, work in politics. So uh, it's how, how things get done. So um, about other members of Congress that where well, you don't have representation, um, I mean, if, if you if you have a friend in that district and you want to work with that friend to to lobby them, uh, that's that's one thing. But members of Congress need to hear from their constituents. If you're not a constituent and you write, you know, send them an email or make a phone call, um, they likely won't count it. They're interested in hearing from the people who are in an area that can elect them. So um, they. So I, I would I would certainly encourage you though to you know to lobby all of your members of Congress and um, friends and family in uh, particularly key districts lobby them and then if you have a member of Congress who's already supportive of diplomacy that's great um, urge them to do more urge them to talk to their colleagues urge them to tweet and write and you know all the same things that Teresa mentioned um, that. You know, we're asking you to do. We, members of Congress can do. They can write letters to the editor. They can write op-eds. Some of them already do, um, but there are really, I mean, there are there are a handful right now of real champions who are working on this day in and day out. I would count like Senator Feinstein, Senator Chris Murphy, um, Congressman Keith Ellison, you know, Congresswoman Barbara Lee. I mean, there's there's some of those people who are really working around the clock on this. Um, but most members of Congress, they you know they can do a whole lot more on this issue, and and that you need to be continue to be engaged with them. I mean, you need to be engaged with all of them, but um, but there are there are more things that you can ask for most members. You can ask them to to um, when you lobby or when you write a letter to the editor, you can ask your member of Congress to tweet about it or write about it or put it on their Facebook page or um, make a public statement and prepare for March third. And um, you know, there's a lot of different th a lot of different angles you can take that. Okay, there was a, a question about what's going on behind the scenes in American politics. Uh, it had to do with the Koch brothers and their relationship with Mitch McConnell uh, and um, the idea that big money in politics is a big problem and that there's a big pushback against that. Uh, and then at the end of all of that is the question which is, I mean, I think the theory here is that the pro-sanctions movement is being well-funded by big money, quote-unquote. And the question is, um, what are the polls saying on what the people want, as opposed to the big money interests? Poll after poll has shown that the overwhelming majority of the American people strongly support these negotiations. We've also seen J Street did a poll of Jewish Americans, and that 84 percent of Jewish Americans in the U.S. support the, the negotiations with Iran um, to limit Iran's nuclear program. So there has been enormous support from the American people. Um, and But I will say that you know members of Congress generally don't make their decisions. I mean, some of them may do, but generally it's not about um, the polls that are out there that we can read about online. It's about the poll that's being taken in their offices. I mean, they're, they're taking a poll every day. It's, it's how many people call in. That, that's the poll that matters. How many people call in, and what are they saying? And if they get 50 calls that oppose, uh, that, sorry, that support um, new sanctions, that's the poll they want to listen to, even though the, um, the overwhelming majority of Americans who answer some pollster say that they support diplomacy, they're listening to the polls in their office, the polls on email, the polls, you know, Teresa mentioned Twitter. I think that's a great way to engage with members of Congress. Um, some of them even run their own accounts. They look at that poll, how many people are actually, the active poll, of people in their district. Um, so uh, I would say that. And then about big money generally, though, I mean, just that, um, yes, I mean, <laughs> certainly big money is in politics is, is a huge issue. And um, and on this issue, definitely you see it. Now, I, I actually haven't seen it with the Koch brothers stuff so much. Um, but, uh, but the point, I mean, the proponents of sanctions, they had a plan A, which was to um, to get the sanctions bill on the floor in January. That's what we heard from Senator Lindsey Graham and Rubio, that there was going to be a vote to tank the negotiations. They didn't call it that. They said they, they, wanted, they just wanted more pressure. But um, they, to, to, you know, to have these deal-breaking uh, sanctions, 
they wanted that in this, this month. They didn't get it because there's been this groundswell of opposition um, to new sanctions. That has, and that's, that's not funded by big money. I mean, <laughs> um, Martin, Teresa, and I, you know, we, we all know the people who are involved in this, and there's no, there's no huge money behind this. This is really, uh, this is about people like all of you on this call picking up the phone and calling your member of Congress and, and doing it on a shoestring, and, and that, that effort has really paid off. Yeah, congratulations to you, Kate, and Teresa, and to everyone on the call who's put so much work into this. Um, okay, have we got time for another question? I've got one here. It says, um, can you give us an idea of the political environment within Iran? Yeah. There is a fierce power battle happening in Iran. There, so at the top is Supreme Leader Khamenei. And then he is looking at um, different forces and trying to I think, ascertain what direction he's going to support. I mean, in the end, any kind of final deal, and in fact, this interim deal, this joint plan of action, was in fact eventually signed off by him. Um, so we have on one side, we have the hardliners, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, for example. Uh, Revol Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, you'll see a lot about them in the news. Um, you hear about how they are behind um, funding the Assad regime, set basically the, the military lifeline for the Assad regime in Syria. Um, and they have you know, just very hardline approach. They have profited off the sanctions regime because as Iranians or as ordinary Iranians can't get access to the global economy, then they have to, in order to survive or in order to, to get a lot of common goods in the market, then you have to um, pay bribes to the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. They control the black market economy. They're, they're, they're a mafia. They're, I mean, a major, a big <laughs> state-sponsored mafia uh, in Iran. And they predominantly have very, you know, some very hardline um, views, and uh, in general against um, compromise with the U.S. On the other side, we have President Rouhani's faction, and they're a much more moderate fact. Very, you know, very different. Um, they, President Rouhani, was elected on a platform of engagement uh, in, in 2013. So it is just made a huge difference if he's come into office um, and then appointed this foreign minister, Zarif, who has spent you know, more of his life in the US than he spent in Iran. I mean, and, and his cabinet has more graduates of American universities than any other cabinet in the world outside of the United States. It's just, it's incredible. Like, it's a very different approach. So you can imagine, I mean, there's a, a huge gulf, there's a huge um, difference in those, those factions, and um, that what happens with this nuclear deal really defines how that um, political landscape looks going forward. Because if we get a nuclear deal, then that empowers the forces of more moderation in Iran, um, and if we don't get a nuclear deal, or worst case is Congress sabotages this deal, then uh, then the hardliners have the upper hand in Iran, and that's um, and that's why we've heard over and over again from people in Iran, from human rights activists, um, that they're putting everything else on hold, like other issues in Iran, uh, because until they get this nuclear deal solved, because they know that will be a defining issue for uh, whether their country moves toward mo more moderation, more um, democracy, all that, or whether it moves uh, regressively toward a more hardline um, stance. Okay, Kate, thanks. I think I'll throw one more question at you um, before we hand this back over to Teresa. Um, and why not send you a fat pitch? Uh, now that Senator Menendez has backed off uh, can we all just uh, relax and cool our jets? <laughs> not for one moment. <laughs> uh, not at all, because what Senator Menendez and other proponents of the legislation um, have done is they've said they're going to hold off on pushing for a vote on new sanctions until March 24th. Now, um, however, what there's, there's other, so there's one, there's Corker's legislation, 
um, which has not been introduced yet. We expect it will be very soon. And that could tank the negotiations by having a vote um, in Congress, you know, on an up or down vote on a deal. This is even before Iran could demonstrate that it's going to comply with a comprehensive deal. Um, and and you know, and, and even if it did, I mean, we've we've seen that this kind of Congress. I mean, if if Congress had voted on the Joint Plan of Action, it's likely it never would have happened because Congress would have rejected it. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's the Corker legislation, which is also important to talk to your members of Congress, to senators about, um, and and there will likely be some House movement on one of these issues soon. And then also, it's, um, I mean, look, because the stakes, you know, have never been higher for getting a comprehensive deal. There is so much pressure. There's, it's, in Iran, it defines the future of um, whether it's, uh, whether there's an, an, a chance for a more democratic um, Iran going forward in the U.S., it's a chance for whether there's a future for a less militaristic foreign policy. And uh, that's what's at stake here. And so it's not going to be easy to get a deal. The negotiators need all the support they can get. And the best way to give that to them is through Congress, to get members of Congress to issue pro-diplomacy statements, not just to, you know, don't don't vote on sanctions and that's all we want you to do. We want you to speak out in support of these negotiations saying that you're going to be a partner in these because eventually, as I said, Congress can make or break a deal, that eventually any kind of deal is going to come to Congress in the form of asking, um, with, with, you know, after Iran has demonstrated its record of compliance, then the president, uh, likely not President Obama actually, the next president, would have to come to Congress and say, um, okay, it's time please lift these sanctions so that, because that's, that's part of the new phase, because Iran has, has made these nuclear uh, changes. And now we need to move forward in making sure we um, adhere to our commitment and that we move forward on a very different path um, that takes us off a pathway toward war and puts us on a pathway toward a peaceful resolution of this issue um, and toward a, a broader, a, a, um, a future where we can talk about, to Iran about de-escalating tensions in Syria and really just making this world a safer place. So there's, um, there's so much opportunity, but there's so much at stake, and so we should all be talking to members of Congress. They're hearing a lot. I mean, this, this is the uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu visit is coming up just around the corner. Um, this is a good time to ask for a meeting now with your member so that you can get one hopefully before, um, like over President's Day weekend, you know, before they are only hearing from um, the Netanyahu crowd. All right. Well, thank you very much, Kate, for answering those questions. And thank you again to everyone and for your excellent questions. We hope that this webinar has empowered you to take action and debunk the myths that people have about Iran sanctions. I'd like to give a special thanks to Kate Gould for sharing her experience with us tonight. We hope to hear from all of you soon, and we hope to see you again on our next webinar. Please look out for our follow-up email tomorrow with more details about the action steps you can take. And have a great night, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, PSR. <laughs> Way to go, Kate. That was great. Thank you so much, Martin. I really appreciate this.